Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Dr. David Jeremiah has started a new series, or a series, written a book called The Great Disappearance. I have a copy of that book and I enjoy it very much because it talks about what will it be like on that day of great disappearance. Are you thinking about that day? Have you given a whole lot of thought about what that day is going to be like? Try to imagine, if you will, two working side by side and having conversation and one will turn and the other will be gone. Hallelujah. Spouses laying one side by side, one wakes up and the other is gone. Kids in their cribs, babies, parents go to wake them up and they're gone. Try to think what the world is going to be like. There's been all kinds of conspiracy theories that we've heard over the last number of years and all of that. And I really have to wonder in my own part of mind, what kind of conspiracy theories will go out on that day? That day of the great disappearance. I've decided what I'm going to do over the next number of weeks is do a series on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought that that would be kind of fitting considering that we are thinking about and celebrating the first coming of the Lord Jesus when he left heaven, came down and took on flesh and became this human being for you and me so that he could die upon the cruel cross of Calvary. Tonight I'm going to be speaking on 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and what the importance of his death, his burial, and his resurrection really is. I wonder how many times have we really considered that and thought about it. What that really means for you and for me. So that is tonight at 6 o'clock. Oh, by the way, I'll just give another advertisement before I get started. Next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, in got it here. Please tell everybody you can, invite all your friends and your enemies and your neighbors and everybody else to come out to this cantata. They will hear the Word of God in music. So make sure you invite a lot of people. As we celebrate the first coming of Christ, but I want to spend time now for the next number of weeks celebrating and, and thinking about the second coming of Christ. How many of us really realize that there are two parts to the second coming of Christ? You have one part where Christ comes down in the clouds and we go up into the clouds and meet him. He does not set foot on the earth the first time. However, there will be seven years later that he will come down and he will set foot upon the earth and he will reign for a thousand years. And guess what, folks? You and I want to have a part in that reigning with him. Amen. So many people think that heaven's going to be just kind of a, 
you know, yeah. you're, you're sitting in a cloud with a harp and you're, you're just kind of fluttering your Tinker Bell wings and all that. That's not what it's going to be like. Heaven is going to be a joyous time. Heaven is going to be a joyous place that we are going to be able to serve and worship the Lord Jesus Christ for all eternity. I have some friends who are pastors. And when we talk about the second coming of Christ, many of them have a hard time teaching on, and many of them even have a hard time in believing the first part of the second coming of Christ. They have a hard time believing in the rapture. Now the word rapture is not found in the scripture, but it does mean to be caught up or to be taken up. We believe here at CCC in a literal rapture of the church where one day the trump of God will sound and the dead in Christ will rise and then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That is going to be a glorious day. I want to look at it as a great day. Give me Zach, Zephaniah 114, if you would please. Listen to what this is. The great day of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that that will be a great day? Amen. A great day when all of a sudden when no one be here, but we're there standing in front of him or bowing before him and seeing him. So the great day of the Lord is near. And I love the way that Zephaniah says this because it says the great day of the Lord is near. It is near. Once again, if God says it once, it's important. But if God says it twice, guess what? It's doubly important. And what is Zephaniah saying? Hey folks, look, the great day of the Lord is near. It's near. Be ready for it. I have to wonder, how ready is the church? How ready are we? How ready am I? Am I ready for the second coming of Christ? At least the, the, the first part of the second coming of Christ, the, the rapture to be taken up? I remember as a young preacher, I would say, I'm not really ready yet because I'm not done my work. Failing to remember or to comprehend that if God takes me up in the rapture, I'm done my work. Because he's not going to take me up before. So wait a minute, I can no longer say, wait a minute, Lord, I, I got some more work to do. God's going to say, no, it is done. What was required of you is done. So Zephaniah goes on and says, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasten this greatly. It's coming faster and faster and faster. How many think that 2023 has, has flown? I don't know if it's my age or what, but $5, 2023 has flown by very, very quickly. Well, Zephaniah is going and saying, look, the great day of the Lord, even the hastiness, it's getting faster and faster. It's getting nearer and nearer every moment. The great, and he calls it the great day of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that the rapture of the church, the taking up of the church, is going to be a great day. Amen. You bet it's going to be a great day. Amen. Matter of fact, we're going to get into this in a few moments, but we're going to see what the Apostle Paul and even the Apostle Peter go and say, guess what? It is a day of hope. Amen. I have a hope today. Now, the word hope does not mean wishful thinking. In the scriptures today, the word hope means to be confident. Or to have an assurance. Let me ask you a question. Are you assured of that day of the rapture, what we call the taking up of the church? Are you assured of that? Are you confident in that? Are you looking forward to that? Or are you one of those who are kind of sitting back and saying, well, I don't know. Could that really happen? Could God really do that? Let me ask you a question. Can God really do it? Yes. You bet he can. 
you get again. But let's look at a couple of scripture verses having to do, first of all, with the believer's hope. Give me 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. This is just to help us to see, kind of a setting the, the foundation for us today. It says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me when? At that day. Now, we have the day of the rapture, the day of the taking of the church. Following that day of the taking of the church, there is going to be what they call, what we call, what we see in Scripture, as the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is a whole lot different than the great white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ has to do with believers. The judgment seat of Christ does not have to do with condemnation. Romans 8.1 there is therefore now no condemnation. It does not have to do with that, but what it has to do with God handing out rewards or crowns, if you will, for the work in which we have done here on earth. Take a moment, if you would, just to think in your own mind. What crowns have I earned? <clears throat> have I served him with all that I have? Have I loved him with all that I have? Do I trust him with all that I have? Is there going to be a crown of righteousness to me? Is there going to be other crowns that, that, that God is going to give, this five crowns that he's going to give that, that will, will go with us? Are we going to receive those crowns on that day? Paul the Apostle says, yeah, there will be a crown of righteousness to me. Why the righteous judge is going to give, it, give me at that day and not to me only, but unto how many? All, all men also that do what? Love his appearing. Let me ask you one. Do you love his appearing? Amen. Are you to the point in your life where you say, Lord, even so, like John said at the end of the book of the Revelation, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus? Amen. Or are you like I used to be? Saying, Lord, not yet. I got too much to do, Lord. I, I, I got too much on my agenda. And then one day God had to speak to my heart and say, Harold, your agenda doesn't matter. I have an agenda. I will not be late. I will not be early. I will be right on time. It's his agenda. I think that maybe that's something that we as the church really need to have to come to comprehension with or come to grips with is, wait a minute, it's no longer my agenda. It has to be his agenda. If Paul goes on and says, look, not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearance. We need to get to the point in our Christian experience where we love his appearance. Lord, I can't wait for you to come back. Lord, I'm expecting you to come back. Lord, I'm anxiously waiting for you to come back. Give me 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, how many of you are looking for the day, the day of the rapture, the day of the taking up, the day of the time when the trumpet of God is going to sound and the dead of Christ will rise? There'll be a shout from the archangel. Are you looking forward to that day? Paul says that the loving of his appearance. Peter says, looking for that day. I think the church needs to spend more time looking for the day. Let, let, me, let me share with you something that, that the God has really spoken to my heart about lately. So many people are trying to read the Psalms. You know, looking at what's happening in Israel looking at what's happening with all the disasters and the, like the tornadoes and the tor tearing apart Tennessee at this point and, and look at all this and say, well, God said that things are going to happen. May I give you a hint? The important thing is not the time of his coming. The important thing is coming to the reality of his coming. Believing he's coming. Not just simply wishful thinking. Not just simply 
saying, well, I read it, but I'm not sure it's true. But coming to the reality of the fact, it is true. And I'm looking for that day, looking for such things. Be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blame. So how should we be living if we were looking for the coming of Christ? And we know that the coming of Christ is a hastening time. It is a time that's coming faster than you and I can expect. Would I be living any differently than I'm living today? Are there things in my life that I would be handing over to him and saying, Lord, get rid of this junk? Would my life be different if I knew that in, you know, there would be a sign up here on the wall and it says, I will be here at noon today. <laughs> what would you do differently? Would you be here at the altar pouring out your heart saying, Lord, I've done this, Lord, I've done this, Lord, I... I we ought to be doing that anyway, shouldn't we? If we were looking for the hastening of the day of Jesus Christ. So you have the Apostle Paul saying, loving his appearing. You have the Apostle Peter saying that we be found in him in peace. Do you have peace about it? Do you have confidence about it, knowing that when the trump does sound and the great archangel shouts, that you're going to be one of the ones caught up with him? I am. I know that that's going to happen to me. Oh, yeah. And do you know it? Are you confident of it? Are you assured of it? It's a great day. As Zephaniah said, that great day is near. That great day is near. Do you believe that it's near? Give me Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. Watch this. That by two immutable things, immutable, who knows what that word means? Unchanging. Unchanging. All right? So, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, look, there are two things that will never change. Two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. So if God says to you and me that there will be a day that the trumpet of God will sound and the dead of Christ shall rise, he was just lying to us, right? He was just saying to us, well, I want you to get excited about something, but it's not really going to happen. Is that what he did? <coughs> or is it going to happen? It's going to happen. Do a beautiful thing. God cannot lie that we might have a strong consolation, a strong hope, strong confidence, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Let me ask you a question. What is your hope set on today? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I tell you what, that is, He is the only one that we are to put our hope on. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. My confidence, not wishful thinking, my hope is built. So He goes and says, The hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, is. Is, is your looking for hastening the, the hastening of the day of Christ? Is that what you're anchored in? Christ, you're coming back. Christ, you're coming back soon. Christ, that day will come and it's coming nearer and nearer and nearer. We could be the raptured generation. Do you believe that? Yes. I do. <clears throat> and he says, look, your consolation, that is the anchor of the soul. And it, yeah, I, I love this, isn't it? Both sure. What's that mean? It's going to happen. And steadfast. It's sealed in heaven. And God will not break his seal. He cannot break his seal. It's steadfast. It's sound. So he says it's both hope sure and steadfast, in which enter into that. Within the veil. Are you going to enter the veil? I am. I am. I'm expecting, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm expecting not to see death. Oh, I'm expecting to be raptured up. That's how close I believe it is. Amen. Now, let me give you the reason for our hope.
Has the rapture ever happened before? Well, I can cite four times. I read about the first one in 2 Kings. What happened to Elijah? He was taken up in a chariot of fire. Did he see death? No. So, Elisha, by the way, in that account that we read earlier, Elisha saw him going up. He witnessed it. He saw it. So you had the first one, first time. And then you have Enoch. Enoch and God were walking one day. And they were having a great conversation. This is just my way of thinking about it. Having a great conversation. And when Enoch said to God, well, I better turn around and head home. It's a long way. And God says, no, it's close to get to heaven. Let's go. And Enoch walked with God. And he was taken up with him. That's twice. Give me Matthew 27, would you please? Now, I don't know how many people know this or remember this scripture, but I want to show it to you. Matthew is the only gospel that shows us. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to bottom. Remember that's Captain Christ's resurrection. <laughs> And the earth did quake, there was an earthquake, and rocks bent. Look at verse 52. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Try to picture yourself right now in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Christ has arisen. The stone's been rolled away. Christ is now going and making his rounds amongst his disciples. But he's not the only one. It says that the saints arose. Would that be the Old Testament saints that have died before? Will that be even some of the New Testament saints that have trusted in Christ and died before Christ died? And they arose from their graves, according to verse 52, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Can you imagine? Try to picture yourself being there in Jesus' day, walking down the cobblestones, maybe buying some bread, buying some meat, and up comes next to you Moses. You turn and you look and say, whoa, that guy looks like Moses. Well, that guy looks like Abraham. That woman looks like, wow, what did I just see? What has just happened? Now, I do not know how many it just says that, that, that the graves of, of many bodies, verse 52, of the saints which slept, arose, and out of the graves of his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared to many. Now when the centurion, and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, what things that were done? Do you think maybe the opening up of the graves? Miracles. Can you imagine? Being a soldier who had just put Jesus to death. And maybe there's a cemetery down a little ways from where the, the cross was. And they're overlooking that cemetery and the graves are open. Mm -hmm. you imagine what they were thinking? Do you think maybe they were saying, whoa, what is going on? But look. And they feel great and say, truly, truly. This is the Son of God. Even the centurion and the soldiers came to believe. So you have the resurrection, if you will, or the taking up of, not resurrection, but the taking up, the ascension of Elijah. You have the taking up of Enoch. You have the taking up of the saints that died before Christ ascended. 
And it says, many women from the day of the holy afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministered unto him, and among which was Mary Magdalene and so forth. And you go and they're, they're ministering to Jesus at his resurrection. So as I counted in scripture, there's at least four times where there was an ascension or there was a taking up. You have Elijah, you have Enoch, you have the Old Testament saints, and you have Jesus. Now my question for you is this. Is there a reason that we should not have a hope in the taking up of the church today? Because of our sin. I mean, wait a minute. He's done it four times already, folks. Do you think he can do it a fifth? <laughs> well, some of you do, and some of you are saying, I'm not sure. <laughs> wait a minute. If he's done it once, he can do it again. Amen. If he's done it four times, whoa, guess what? We better be looking and longing for that coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because he's already done it. Amen. And you and I are going to be a part of that one day. So many in the church today are so anxious about looking at the times and they're not really looking at the reality of the fact this is, not could, this is going to happen. Amen. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not wishful thinking. It's not just trying to scare people into heaven and all this other stuff. No, that is not it. The greatest truth you and I ought to be thinking about is not the timing of his coming, it is the reality of his coming. Are you sure? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is coming? I am. I have no doubts about it. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Once again, Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us. By the way, the word begotten is a very interesting word. It's a word used for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it talks about having a father-son relationship. Okay? That's what it really means. It's a father-son relationship. The son leaves heaven and comes down to earth. You still have that father-son relationship. And over 70 times in the Gospels, Jesus is referring to God as Father. Okay, so it has to do with a father son relationship. Now, how about you and me? Has begotten who? Ah, let me ask you a question. Do you have a father son or a child father relationship with God? We ought to have. Why? Because we, we are begotten of him. He's my father. That's why we. That's why Jesus taught his disciples, saying, "Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name." That's what the word begotten means. So he has begotten us again unto a lively or a living hope. Do you have a living hope today? That Jesus Christ one day is coming back soon? Is your hope alive? Or is it kind of laying dormant there saying, well, I hope he does, but I'm not sure he will. No. Change that way of thinking. Make it a living hope. A hope saying, I know he's coming back, and today could be that day. Amen. Before I get done preaching, it could be that day. Some of you say, I hope so. <laughs> right? But make it a living hope. He said, look, I am a living hope. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what makes it all possible. Christ, in his resurrection, conquered sin, conquered death. It made it possible that now we can have that taking up or that gathering up of God's church one day, very soon. I have a living hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In April, we'll be celebrating Easter, right? We'll be celebrating the wonderful resurrection of our Lord. But we ought to be celebrating that every day. Every day ought to be Easter to us. My way of thinking, every day ought to be Christmas. <coughs> When Jesus came down into my flesh. For me. Give me verse 13 of St. chapter, please. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Think seriously. 
All right, not flippantly, mysteriously, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation or the revealing of Jesus Christ. When he comes down and he meets us in the cloud. Now, there are three basic portions of Scripture <coughs> that have to do with, with, with the uh, rapture. With the, in, in its, its uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and John chapter 14. So he gives us those three full chapters talking to us about that. Helping us to see that, yes, we can be assured of that. Give me Hebrews 6.18. We've already seen it once, but I want to look at it again. That by doing beautiful things, that which is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. We have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Let me ask you a question. Do you have that glorious hope? <coughs> Boy, I do. We ought to be every moment, when we wake up in the morning, we every moment, is this today? Is this today, Lord? Mm -hmm. Oh, I hope so. Is this today? Be a great day. Give me First Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. Mm -hmm. Watch this one happen. I will not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Well, Unfortunately, in my view, now I'm not talking about CCC in particular, but I really think sometimes the church is really lacking, the church is really sleeping when it comes to the, the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not living as if we expect him to be appearing any moment, at any time. You know, we're, we're like what, what, what Peter goes and says, you know, that, that people are People are saying, hey, Peter, he hasn't, he hasn't come back yet. It's already been a thousand years, Peter. Where, where is he? Come on, Peter. And they start mocking him and laughing at him and scoffing at him because he's talking about the coming of Christ. And certainly a lot of people are doing that today, right? But 2,000 years. Where is he? I guess he's not coming. Oh, yeah, he's coming. Amen. And he's coming soon. Listen to what Paul says in Thessalonians. That wouldn't have you ignorant, brother, to turn them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Why is it that we are not to sorrow when we lose a loved one, as those who have no hope? Why is it we shouldn't sorrow? We, that doesn't mean we shouldn't sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. Why? Because we have the hope. I'm going to see him again. I'm going to see all those that have gone before me that, that, you know, have been a part of my ministry, a part of my family, a part of my life. I'm going to rejoice with them one day. So I don't have to sorrow as those who have the hopes because I have a hope that one day, guess what, we're going to be together again. It's going to be a great homecoming. And that homecoming will be when God calls up his church. To go be with him. So we don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe, and the word if can be translated because we believe, by the way. So because we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, You have a loved one that's in heaven. The clouds going to depart, break open. Christ is going to descend. The saints are going to descend. Alice, Jimmy's going to take you by the hand as I walk home on you. My dad's going to take me by the hand and say, Welcome home, son. Those loved ones in which you know that have gone to glory are going to come with him and say, Welcome home. Good to see you. Now we're going to spend eternity together with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
point. We got to wrap our, our, our minds around that and our hearts around that to say, yes, this is going to happen. This is not a fairy tale. This is not wishful thinking. Look what he says. Jesus died once again, even then, which also sleeping Jesus will God bring with him. Those that have gone before us are going to come down. We're going to come up and we're going to meet them in the clouds. But this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. So Paul was saying, look, I'm not just telling you a story that I, that I dreamt about last night. God gave me this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God gave me this. I was given it by the word of the Lord. That we which are alive and reign unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, stop, those who are asleep. By the way, we could be there at the cemetery, we could be looking, all of a sudden the thing is opening up. I'm sorry, you can stop on it all you want, but you're not going to stop it. That's going to open up. Just like that. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, they're going to rise up. And then instantaneously, we will rise with them. Isn't that glorious? Do you have that hope? Do you have that assurance that that's going to happen? Are you living that way? Look what he says. You will not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall be sent, come down, from where? From heaven, because that's where he is. See it at the right hand of the Father. From heaven, he's going to do it with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead of Christ shall rise first. Then we which remain, we that are here, shall be caught together with them. Who's the them? Those that have gone before us, that are going to come down with the Lord Jesus, and going to meet us in the clouds, and we're going to have a grand reunion as God takes us up to be with Him. That's going to happen someday. And look, we caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, or wherefore, comfort ye one another. Should, I, should it be something that I should be afraid of? Should it be something that I should be hesitant to talk about? Because, well, uh, you know, some people are going to think I'm really, I just smoked a little too much weed or something. Wow. <laughs> no, man. This is truth. Yeah. It's going to happen. But are we living as Paul told us to live? And are we living as Peter told us to live? With that great expectation of the great disappearance of the church? It's going to happen. There's going to be a great homecoming one day where you and I get to go home to be with our, our wonderful loved ones that have gone before us that have known Christ. It will be a day of great healing. Great healing. Why? Because we're all going to have resurrected bodies, brand new bodies, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh yes, Jesus Christ still had the prints of the nails in his hands and the, the hole in his side. Why? Because to go to the Father, every time the enemy goes and says, Do you see what Harold Lloyd did? Jesus points to his hands and says, I paid for that. His wounds are there just to show what he did for us. But he's going to have a resurrection. He, he has a resurrected body. <coughs> we know that, for example, in Acts, where they were in the upper room and they were afraid the soldiers were going to come and remember and take them away. And what did Jesus do? He appeared before them. He didn't even have to ask them to unlock, unlock the door. He just so walked right through. Brand new body. How many are you looking for a brand new body? <laughs> Man, I tell you, I can't wait. I'm going to have a brand new body. All my cancer is going to be gone. All my arthritic pain is going to be gone. I won't even need glasses. The cavities, gone. All sickness, gone. It's going to be a wonderful healing for all eternity. Boy, we got to grab a hold of that to say, Lord, 
Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Oh, it's going to be a great healing. If you have a great day of happiness, can you imagine being caught up and seeing your loved one come down and their arms open wide to you, saying, Welcome home? How about that day of happiness when you stand there at the gate and Jesus comes and wraps his arms right around you? And he embraces you with an embrace like you've never had before in your life. And Jesus saying to his bride, Welcome home. What a day of happiness that will be. Boy, I tell you what, if we looked forward to that day, I think sometimes our attitudes would be a whole lot different. Our perspectives would be a whole lot different, wouldn't it? If I was looking forward to that day, the hastening of the day, the looking for it, the lively hope that Peter talks to us about. Looking forward to that day. It's going to be a great day of happiness. It's going to be a great day of healing. It's going to be a great day of holiness. I think above all of this, I can't wait for that day when for all eternity I will not have to, if there's sleeping in heaven, and I don't know if there is or not, but to wake up and not have to pray, Lord, protect me from sin today. Make it so that I don't hurt you today. Make it so that I don't fail you today. You won't have to pray that. Why? Because it's going to be a great day of holiness. Give me Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it. When? Until the day of Jesus Christ. He will perform on that day and we're caught up in Him, we will be completely holy. We will not have to worry about sin any longer. We won't have to worry about disappointing Him. We won't have to worry about doing things that are contrary to Him. We won't have to worry about that be the last thing that we have to worry about. We don't have to worry about it. Why? Because He will perform it at the day of Jesus. He will make you and me completely, completely holy. <coughs> Never to sin again. Isn't that glorious? Amen. Give me Galatians 5. Uh. For we through the Spirit wait. Are we waiting? Yes. I'm anxiously waiting. Are we waiting for the hope of righteousness by faith? Oh, I mean about walking in righteousness. I mean about living in righteousness. But there will be a day that I will be totally, 100% sinless and righteous in Jesus Christ. Because I'll be with Him. Isn't that good news? Isn't that something for you and I to rejoice in? Isn't that something for you and I to be, to be excited about? That we should look for that day? You know, as we look forward to Christmas, and we, we look forward to, to remembering the first time that Jesus came as a child and, and put on humanity to you and me to suffer what he had to suffer, to go through what he had to suffer. But that's just the beginning. Now we have this glorious hope that in 1 Thessalonians, one day, the trump of God was sound and a shout from the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Boy, I hope you believe that. I know an awful lot of people who call themselves Christians, and maybe they are, but say, ah, I can't believe that. That's a fairy tale. It is not a fairy tale, folks. And for the next number of weeks, we're going to be looking at scriptures to prove this is what the Word of God teaches. And if the Word of God teaches, then guess what? It's true. Mm -hmm. It is real. It is something for you and I to believe in. You know, to be alive and not to have to worry about sin ever again. To live in His righteousness and in His holiness. Oh, what a day that will be.
when my Jesus I shall see, I will look upon his face and see the wonder, see the wonder of his grace. Mm. Are you looking forward to that wonderful, wonderful mm. grace of Jesus? Yes. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Father, we thank you so much for the truth of it, for the realization of it. And Father, I just ask that you would truly help us to recognize it and to see it. And Father, to believe it. Oh Lord God, please. Minister to our heart's needs. Father, if we're not anxiously looking forward to it, Lord, tune our hearts to see it. Tune our hearts to be excited about it. Tune our hearts to be expected to see it happen at any time. Mm -hmm. Oh, Father, be with us. Help us to be a church looking forward, looking for the lively hope that is in Christ Jesus. So, Father, minister to us in your precious and glorious name. Amen. Amen. By your side, I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by 